Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. I'm David Bird with Reality Reimagine. I'm an award-winning photographer and Photoshop artist that specializes in fantasy composite art. Today we have a full tutorial where I'm going to take an image all the way through the entire process of retouching and artistic enhancement to be able to realize the story within and what the original image maker wanted within that story. This is the image that we're going to be working on today. This was sent to me by my friend Chanel Bledsoe. I think that's how you pronounce your last name, Ch Chanel. If I totally screw that up, I completely apologize. You can let me know when we see each other in April. But Chanel reached out to me and said, hey, this is a picture of her daughter. She photographed this in a historical building where apparently some Civil War and Confederate soldiers fought and died in this space. And she was not able to fully get the enhancements and the digital photo editing to the image to realize the story the way she wanted it to be. First and foremost, at the time that she's shooting this, she's fighting pure daylight, and I believe she wanted it to be more dark and moody because what she wanted is, and I quote, I wanted the story to be a child who basically looked like she was the last alive in a battle. Not necessarily bloody, just scarred, dirty, but beautiful and strong. I love that. I really do. I love that. The last one left to take over in a brutal world. The big windows, I feel, show too much light, and I'd like it to look more brooding, not so bright and pretty, quote-unquote, outside. So that's what we're going to do today with this image. We're going to do some of the basics that we would always do, like processing the image in Adobe Camera Raw, straightening out some of the horizon lines and elements of architecture that we see in the image, doing a retouch with frequency separation, dodging and burning, but then we'll start doing practical passes to the image where we're going to build up the lights that we need to see, the dark and dramatic moody lighting. Then we'll move into color grading, changing out the sky so that we'll have some dark stormy skies in the background, then the color grades and adding all that fun artistic enhancement to this. There will be timestamps at the bottom of the screen so that you'll be able to skip ahead if you wish to, to follow through with this tutorial. If you'd like to see more of Chanel's amazing work, she is truly a wonderful photographer. My friend, you are a wonderful photographer. Then take a look at the Instagram link at the bottom of the screen. So let's dive in and begin the process with working with the image in Adobe Camera Raw. The first thing that I like to do is to try to assess the subject in the image as well as the background against the three fundamentals of digital photo editing, which is color, luminosity, and detail. So as I look at Chanel's daughter, I see immediately from a luminosity perspective that I want to start pulling out some of the shadows so we get some more detail into the costume and we can see more of her face. That's going to give the illusion that the image is getting brighter, but it's not technically getting brighter because we aren't adding more exposure to it, although I think exposure is definitely in order with this. So when I process this, I want to process for the subject of Chanel's daughter. I don't necessarily want to always worry about the background and making sure the background looks pretty. And I've said this in previous videos on the channel that when I process raw files, I am not trying to make the raw file pretty. I'm not trying to make it final artwork. I want to get it prepared to take it into Photoshop to use the tools in Photoshop to achieve that. Adobe Camera Raw is the exact same as Lightroom's develop module. So if you're familiar with Lightroom and use that process, much of your artistic goal in Lightroom is to beautify the image to final artwork for print because that's what Lightroom is built to do, whether it be the develop module or presets. For Adobe Camera Raw, the idea here is to look at it from the perspective of what can we do to start enhancing the image to take it into Photoshop to then do the beautiful work. And this is something that is a reflection of digital photography and what digital photography lets us be able to do in digital photo editing. So first I'm going to start pulling out the shadows and get some more detail into Chanel's daughter and I can see some more detail in her face and I think it looks pretty good. Now with all things in the basic tab here in Adobe Camera Raw, I want to think about counterpoint. So if I'm going to change one thing like shadows, I want to change the counterpoint of that, and that's highlights. So I'm going to pull the highlights down just a little bit. Obviously, there's some strong highlights in the windows. I'm not worried about that because I'm going to be changing the background to a dark, stormy sky. But I'm just looking at the overall highlights on her daughter. Again, that counterpoint between shadows and highlights. I'm going to increase the white point in the scene. That's going to let Photoshop reevaluate all the data based upon a new white point. And again, that counterpoint doing the same for the black point as well. And this is giving us a little bit of that contrasted feel and luminosity value. Now, contrast, obviously, we have a slider for that. But as I've said in previous videos, contrast affects the luminosity values, whites and blacks and midtones. But it also affects the color at the same time. The whites and blacks sliders here does just pure luminosity change to the image. And that's why I love addressing it here 
to get some contrast in the overall scene. Now I'm gonna go ahead and give it just a little boost of exposure so that we can see a little bit more detail into her face. Again, I know I want this to be a dark and dramatic image that can be achieved in Photoshop using various tools there. I'm preparing the image in Adobe Camera Raw to go to Photoshop. I'm not trying to do all the beautiful artwork right here in this program. So moving on from luminosity, let's go to color and detail. I'm gonna increase the texture just a little bit in the scene and I'm gonna give it a boost of vibrance. I love that the overall palette is relatively neutral in gray tones. It's gonna to let the yellows and the oranges in her hair, the red lipstick and so forth stand out significantly and let the audience's focus be driven to her by color. And that's one of the integral components we can work with here. So I'm gonna push the vibrance just a little bit more. Now, even though we have a neutral palette of gray, I do see a lot of yellows in the overall tones throughout the entire piece, and that's a reflection of the color temperature of the white balance as it was shot. So right now it's at 6100. I'm gonna decrease that just a little bit, maybe down to about 5800. I'm gonna get some of that cool blue back into this because again, dark and dramatic, we can balance the warm yellow tones of her daughter against the blue tones that we would see everywhere else, and that's a good color harmony to work with. So at this point, I think the basic changes that I wanted to make are good. The next thing that I want to do in Adobe Camera Raw is to straighten out the image just a little bit, both the horizon line at the base, but then also try to change the architecture that is leaning in. Now, this is not a reflection of Chanel's photography at all. This is just a problem of the convex nature of the lenses themselves. The glass extends outward. It's going to warp things, especially straight lines that are close to camera or far away. This is just a consequence of photography. So to affect that, I'm going to come down to geometry. Now, geometry is a wonderful new tab that came to Adobe Camera Raw a few iterations ago, where essentially it moved from being a tool that was over here into its own tab. This is essentially Photoshop. It's going to crop the image because it's going to try to straighten out the lines that it sees. You have a lot of controls here and how you can show Photoshop what to look for in the image that are straight lines, right angles and buildings and so forth to fix all of that but oftentimes I will simply use the auto option and it does generally a pretty good job. So I'm just going to simply click A for auto and that quickly it straightened out the horizon line and all of these lines in the windows. Now, as a consequence of this, of course, it doesn't have the data that it can make up here, but that's what Photoshop is for. Once we take it into Photoshop, we can use Content Aware Fill, the clone stamp tool, flipping the image horizontally if we need to, all kinds of things to be able to get information in the piece and fill in these blanks. So at this stage, I think everything looks good. I'm gonna take it into Photoshop now. One last little thing that I wanna point out is that we're working in a 16-bit color depth bit data rate as well as the Adobe RGB 1998 color spade. So I strongly recommend and suggest that you work in 16-bit and not 8-bit because it gives you access to several million more colors and it's gonna make your image just that much stronger. So we're ready to dive into Photoshop. I'm gonna go ahead and hit open and move into the next stage of this, which is the retouch. Actually, correction, before we jump into the retouch, let's go ahead and fill in these blanks in these empty spaces of what we're missing. So the image is open. The first thing that I'm going to do is to release the lock that's on it that will turn it from being called background to layer zero. This is essential if I want to try to use Content Aware Fill to repair this. So I wanna make a selection now of the areas that need to be addressed with Content Aware Fill using Adobe Sensei, which is the AI of Photoshop. So. To make that selection, I'm gonna come up to the marquee tool here. This is the polygonal lasso tool. I'm uh, not marquee tool, I'm sorry, the lasso tool. This is the polygonal lasso tool. So that essentially I can make anchor points and make a pretty good selection of this. So I'm gonna make a general selection there. Once I get the marching ants, I know I have my active selection on camera left. I wanna make another one on camera right as well. So to do that, I'm gonna hold shift and click and make new selection marks for these areas that I want to use Content Aware Fill on. And because I held Shift, it's adding to the selection. If I didn't hold Shift and I clicked over here, it would immediately disengage the selection in favor of a new one that I'm trying to make. Now that I have those two selections set, I'm gonna come up to Edit and then down to Content Aware Fill. This is gonna open up the new dialog in Photoshop. I think it came out Photoshop CC 20, blah, blah, blah. And it's a wonderful content dialog here that you can look at and be able to adjust how Adobe Sensei is looking at material to use to make up something new in those spaces. Anything painted in green is potentially being sourced by the AI to make up that new area. 
and then you get your line view here. Now on the right side of the document, it actually looks really good. The left side, not so much. So let's remove some of the data here to see if we can fix this. So I'm simply just painting with the brush. It's in reductive mode, so it's taking away the green paint and then therefore that's going to change what a sensei samples to fix this. That got it a little bit better. Um, let's go ahead and take away the painting from Chanel's daughter and maybe some of the area of the floor. And let's just try to force it to look at the wall and see if it can use that as good information. Taking away the window here. And then I'm gonna go into additive mode for the brush and paint back this section here and see if that helps. Now it's thinking about it. I can tell by this little wheel. Once we get a result here, we'll see where we're at. Actually, it made things a lot worse. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Control Z and go back a few steps, let it reevaluate again because I really liked the right side. The left side is an easy fix just using the clone stamp tool or the document itself. So once we have that in place, yep, right side looks perfect. Left side is pretty close. I think we're okay with this. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit OK. Now it's gonna put us back into Photoshop. The first thing I want to do is hit Control or Command and the letter D for deselect to get rid of those active selections. Now everything that Adobe Sensei just made up is on its own new layer at the top. So it needs to be compressed down into this, but we can see before and after. It did a really good job of filling in that section on the bottom. And this section here, it's just struggling a little bit because there wasn't a lot of data there for it to be able to sample to make something new. But it cleaned up this area through here really well. This is a simple fix to work with this. All I want to do now is go ahead and flatten the entire document. I'm going to come up to layer and then down to flatten image. You can press those two layers down into the background layer itself. Now with that engaged, I could use the clone stamp tool. I could make a selection and copy that data and flip it and all this other kind of stuff. Really simple way to, to work with this. And it's one that is a teaching moment here, I guess, where some of the best solutions are the most simple in Photoshop. And it's a testament to why it's important to learn why things work in Photoshop and build up that skill set. I'm going to duplicate the layer by hitting Control or Command and the letter J for duplicate. And now with that active, I'm going to come up to edit, transform and flip horizontal. Now I have the document completely flipped. I'm going to hit B for the basic brush, and then I'm going to make sure my layer is selected and come down to this icon, which is the layer mask icon. I'm going to hold alt or option and click it. That will make a black mask or a hide all. Now I want to change my foreground color from white to black from black. I'm sorry, to white. So I'll be painting white on this black layer mask, which is a hide all. When I paint white, it will begin to reveal the area. Let me make sure that I'm on a soft round brush. Grab my Wacom pen. I use a Wacom Intos Pro tablet. I strongly recommend that you use a pen tablet if you don't currently use one when you work in Photoshop. Now I paint better left to right. I don't paint better and have better control with the pen painting up and down. So I'm gonna hit the R key and rotate my screen and get it to a rough horizontal area and then hit B for the basic brush. My flow and opacity of my brush is set to 100% painting with white and start revealing that other side of the wall and pull it down. Now this doesn't have to be a accurate, perfect painting of this and matching up all of the architecture and so forth, although that actually looks really good. Uh, let me continue that thought here in just a moment, but to get back to the normal portrait orientation of the image, once we rotated the screen, all I have to do is hit the escape key. Now if I hit Z for the zoom, and zoom in a little bit. That looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and feather out the effect just a little bit. I'm changing the flow of my brush to 10% and just painting on a little bit of a dark line through here and extending that window sill all the way across to about there and that's good. What I was saying where this doesn't have to be perfect is because this is on the extreme edges of the document. Once I'm done with the color grade and all the artistic enhancement, I plan on typically adding a vignette to the entire scene. It's another tool that you can use to drive the audience's focus directly into the subject. Once we add that vignette and color grades and textures and so forth, all of those little potential imperfections are going to disappear to the point that it's not even wor worth trying to work on that for something like this. It's just going to be a waste of time ultimately. So now 
we're ready to do the retouch. And this is something that I've done quite a bit uh, in the different uh, videos on the channel. So if you're new to the channel, welcome. Take a look at the card above when you're done with this video. It will take you to the retouching series on this channel. There are, I think, like 16 videos in that series, that playlist, that goes through all of the basic techniques of retouching, including the one that I'm going to use, which is frequency separation, dodging, and burning. Those two combined, are a powerhouse of retouching capability in any digital image. And it's one that I use on every single image I work on in Photoshop. So that it can be a lengthy kind of thing, I'm gonna go ahead and do that and then just show you the effects of what we've achieved. But really visit those videos in that playlist. There's also a free action that you can download. It's the same action that I'm about to use that populates all the layers for frequency separation, for dodging and burning, and the layers that I use to enhance human eyes. So give me a second, I'll be right back with that retouch. The retouch is complete using frequency separation and dodging and burning, and I want to take you through the things that I did very quickly to show you how we can utilize these basic retouching techniques to create not only good scan and so forth, but to be able to focus on the story elements that we want to see in the piece itself. So starting with the folder for frequency separation here, I didn't do any skin smoothing at all because again, we want her to look as if she's in the middle of a battle zone. So having any kind of strong texture or color in her skin would just help to accentuate that effect. But because of the ability of frequency separation to separate the details from the color, I was able to come in and start painting in some extra damage to her skin. This is simply using a haze brush that I have created and sampling some of the darker tones of her skin from her underarms in these shots, using that color on a blank layer here that is below the detail layer, but above the main color layer. So it's replacing the existing colors that we see, but we still have the skin texture preserved. On a low flow of the haze brush, I was able to paint in all of these areas on her face and arms to make it look like she had survived this battle zone. And so that's one of those simple little effects. But the heavy handed work here or the major lifting that these retouching techniques are doing is with dodging and burning itself. So coming up to the second folder group for dodge and burn, I use the curves adjustment method for dodging and burning, and this is where a lot of that work is coming into play. So looking close at Chanel's daughter, the main subject of the image, when I take the burn away, we can see that I'm painting in and accentuating the shadows that we see across her body and in the background itself. This type of dodging and burning is called global dodge and burn, and it is essentially meant to augment the three-dimensionality of the image itself. We are looking at a two-dimensional image, but we're able to augment some of that three dimension by adding more artificial highlight and shadow into the scene. So we have some more of the burn in play, and then if we look at the dodging that I did into the scene, we're adding some brightness not only on Chanel's daughter, but we're also adding brightness around the entire area as well. Dodging and burning is a benefit to a human subject, but also use it in the landscape around them. Or if you're a landscape photographer or you're not photographing human subjects, dodging and burning can go a very long way to be able to build up some interesting effects. Now in my action, it populates two different curves adjustment layers that are for color burn and color highlights and in this one I did not use color burn but I did use the color highlights to give just a little bit of a boost to certain areas on her dress and her hair because these things I am planning on doing the artistic color grade to accentuate those colors that we see there and balance that against the blues that will be working into the background itself. So if I build up a little bit more brightness in those areas where I know I want color to come through to the audience, it's just going to help achieve that result a little bit stronger when we get to the final artwork. So that is the entire process of retouching. It's a very simple process to do. I strongly recommend that you visit Frequency Separation if you don't know how to do it because there is so much you can do once you have separated detail from color and it goes way beyond just retouching a human being there's so many other things we can do and create some beautiful realistic results but now I want to move into the next step and that step is to do some practical passes to the image what I call practical passes using multiple layers and taking those layers into frequent or I'm sorry into Adobe Camera Raw and getting different exposures and so forth that we can bring all of these layers or practical passes together using layer masks to really achieve a more dramatic lighting result and hit that story that this young lady is in the middle of a battle zone. So let's step into that next section. 
To begin making practical passes, I need to duplicate this original background layer, and I tend to do this in stages of three. So I'm going to duplicate it twice by hitting Control or Command and the letter J twice. Now I have background layer, layer one, and layer one copy. I'm gonna name layer one copy shadows, layer one midtones, and then the original background layer for right now, I'm going to label this as highlights and hit enter. So with this in mind, the first thing I want to do is come to the topmost layer or for the shadows, and I'm gonna hit Control, Shift, and A, or Command, Shift, and A on a Macintosh to take the layer into Adobe Camera Raw as a filter. Now this layer, it needs to be its namesake. I want to essentially create a practical pass of this image as if I were on set with the camera to get a really dark scene. So to achieve that, I'm gonna to come to the Basics tab, I'm gonna decrease the exposure significantly. So let's go down, we're at two, negative 2.15. Let's pull it back just a little bit. Let's go to an even negative two. Let's take the highlights down. Take the white point up just a little bit. The black point will increase that. And let's also add some contrast, the traditional contrast, which is going to affect the color, but that's okay in this case. I think that looks pretty good. Let's back this down maybe just a little bit, the exposure. So let's go to negative 1.75. Mm, yeah, I like that. This is a dark, neutral pass to the scene, and that's exactly what we need to use this with a layer of midtones and then the original layer itself, combine them all together with layer masks. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit OK. Then I'm gonna put a black mask onto this by coming again to the layer mask icon, holding Alt or Option, and now we have that black mask and it's hiding everything. Now I'm going to the layer of midtones, hitting Control, Shift, and A, or Command, Shift, and A on a Mac, going back into Adobe Camera Raw. In this case, I want to do the same thing we just did, but do it at like half intensity. So we were at negative 1.75, I believe. So let's come down to around negative one-ish, negative uh, 9.5. I don't know the arithmetic and the mathematics of an even trade. I, I'm an artist, I'm not a mathematician. I'm gonna pull the highlights down again, increase that contrast just a little bit, increase the white point just a little bit too, increase the black point. Let's pull those highlights down just a little bit more. Black point looks pretty good. And let's go ahead and take the exposure uh, about negative 0.75. That looks pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. And then again, put a black mask onto this one, take the highlights to the top. Now we have a couple of ways of doing this. And this is just a systemic approach to what I want to do. Whatever flow makes the most sense to you is what I suggest you do. What I like to do is simply look at this layer of highlights and say, okay, I know what this is, I like what it is, and I want to call back to this layer of highlights whenever I need to. But first, I wanna start building the scene of darkness or shadows and use midtones as a balance or a feathering of the entire effect and then pull in the highlights whenever I need it. So in that case, what I'm going to do is put another black mask or hide all onto this highlights layer, which now is hiding all three layers so we don't see any of it and we have the checkerboard pattern. With this in mind, I'm going to rearrange the layer stack so that my shadows layer is at the bottom, my midtones is in the middle, and the highlights is at the top. And incidentally, any kind of control in Photoshop that deals with luminosity values, you're going to have shadows on the left, highlights on the right, and midtones right in the center. This is how it works best for me to be efficient as an artist building all of this up. So to start, I'm gonna take this layer mask and hit Control or Command and the letter I, and that's inverting the mask to make it now white. So it's revealing the entire area. This is my new base layer that I'm gonna start painting white onto the midtones layer at a low flow of let's say 5% and start pulling in some key areas where I want to see more light coming into the scene. Now, where are those areas? How do I, ident I identify this? It's actually very simple think about it's, it's problem solving and i mean this respectfully in what i say this is common sense i don't mean that to be negative common sense where does the light need to come in it needs to come in through the windows those are the light source we don't want this to look like it is being artificially lit by strobes on set as a photographer this isn't a typical portrait photo shoot we're creating a piece of artwork so let's pay attention to that light 
in those key areas being around those windows. So I'm increasing my brush by hitting the right and left bracket keys. Again, on a low flow of 5%, let me make sure that I'm still on a soft round brush. I'm not, so I'm gonna come back to that soft round and just start painting white to reveal the areas of light where I want to see it. I'm doing it around the windows because if we think about it, light would come in and spill in. It's omnidirectional because of the sun or the moon and it's flying in and traveling around the area where the areas nearest to the light source, those would be the brightest. And then it would taper off and feather out from there. So just giving it a little bit more paint through those areas. Then I'm gonna hit the floor just a little bit in these areas because again, light traveling in from the windows bouncing down would hit the floor itself. Then I'm going to go ahead and come in to Chanel's daughter and just start giving her a little bit of a boost of midtones around her arms, around the sides of her body where the light would travel and wrap around her a little bit. And then I'm going to hit the middle of her face just a touch. Now, this is where I want to have a teaching moment that technical precision is where you want to start when you feel that you're struggling going, well, what do I need to do? Where do these lights need to come in? Think about the technical precision of how light travels, where it bounces off of things, what should be illuminated. But then we get to the really hard part and the hard part is to find a balance between technical precision and what looks good in the art. And more often than not, what looks good in the art goes right, flies into the face of technical precision. So you have to find that balance. And this can be a challenge because depending upon your type of personality as an artist, maybe you want to follow the rules of technical precision all the way through creating the art. There's nothing wrong with that. But you are going to have to do some hard work just as much as the right brain creative folks who don't want to follow technical precision all the way through. They just want to be free spirited and follow what their imagination does. Eventually they have to do the hard work and start answering the questions or the needs of technical precision so that the artwork looks real and that the artwork hits the intended intent of storytelling to the audience. You don't want to produce all of this artwork, do all of this hard work, put it out into the world, and the audience tears it apart because it's not following some of the basic rules of what we see every day as human beings on this planet. So finding that balance between technical precision and artistry and what looks good to the art is always something that you have to work on. And in this case, I am hitting her face just a little bit with those midtones because with her arms being where they are, they would be blocking her face if these were the only two primary light sources. And it's going to be at night, it's going to be dark and dramatic, so we wouldn't see as much light on her face from a technical precision kind of place. But from an artwork perspective, I want to be able to see the young lady. I need to see her face. I need to see the solemn look as she's putting this crown on top of her head that she's surviving all the ugliness of war. If I can't see her face as an audience member, I can't connect to her in that story, and that story is therefore lost. So. For the sake of story and art, I want to illuminate her face just a little bit more. Hitting the center of her body just a touch, making sure we still have those highlights and so forth, and it all looks good. Again, to address what I just talked about, technical precision, if I really wanted to be technically precise, I could have made a selection of just Chanel's daughter so that I could paint in and let it affect her and not the background. Since this is a two-dimensional image, if I'm painting white onto the layer mask to reveal the brighter areas, that wall is getting revealed and so is her body. So to be technically precise, I could make that selection and really go to the nines for this. But does it really matter at this point? I don't think it does. So we've got the light. We've got where we need it to be. I think we're good to go there. And now we can return to the topmost layer, the highlights, which is originally our original layer that we worked on Adobe Camera Raw. I'm going to change the flow of my brush now to 3% flow. I always leave the opacity in my brushes at 100% and I change the flow so that I can build up these effects. Now this is where I do want to zoom in just a little bit and do some careful precise painting, but I still don't think I need to go to the level of making a selection, cleaning up the mask and all that kind of stuff. So painting some white right here on the edges of her arms because those key highlights need to come into play. Let's hit the crown just a little bit and let that stand out. Those areas where we hit with the special dodge and burn, the color highlights, let's let those stand out a little bit more. I'm gonna change the flow of my brush to 1% because I'm getting just too much paint too quickly and I need just a little bit more control in where it comes in so that I can build it up. Let's paint some more through the sides of the dress and let it stand out just a little bit more. I wanna hit that beautiful golden hair a little bit more. Okay, and then I'm gonna hit her face just a touch, bring back some of that light so that we can see her eyes. 
and connect to the story through there. Get those hairs back through here. That looks good. I'm hitting controller command of the number zero to zoom all the way back out on the document. And I think that looks good. Let's go ahead and turn it on and off really quickly just to do before and after and see. Before and after, before and after. Yeah, it looks pretty good. We hit the wall a little bit so we can switch our foreground color back to black and just take it away. Again, at that low flow of 1%, we're just being precise. When I paint, more often than not, it has been my practice since the very beginning when I started working in Photoshop 4.0. I don't try to paint inside the lines very carefully. I, I am careful with the work, but I don't get really meticulous and zoom in and very carefully just stay and paint in those lines because that takes more time. I have found that it is easier for me to make a couple of simple brush strokes. If the edge of the brush goes just outside the line, that's okay because then I can just simply switch to the other color, use the eraser tool, whatever it is, and go back to that edge and just clean it up with a couple of simple strokes. It's more efficient for me and it gives me a better artistic flow. But this is where you need to find what works best for you. I think that looks good. I'm going to hit B for brush one more time, paint white onto the mask to reveal all of this. And I'm going to bring it in on the floor. I just want a couple of those little touches of brighter light on the floor. And this is a subtle little gesture that ultimately building up subtle little keys like this lets the audience believe more of the realism of the artwork we're trying to build. As I've said many times in videos on the channel, you don't want to do anything 100% in Photoshop. Subtlety is key inside of Photoshop. This is a subtle little gesture of light on the floor, maybe a little bit around the window sills again, just that builds up some of that realism. And again, on a low flow of 1%, we get the greatest amount of control we can have to be able to build all of this up. So paying attention to that though, subtlety is key inside of Photoshop. I'm going to take this layer and the layer mask, and I'm gonna simply reduce the opacity to like 80% because I wanna feather out that effect just a touch so that we don't have one strong focus element that's pulling us right into a key area. And what I mean by that is if we have one bright area, audience's eyes are prone to go to the brightest thing in an image and that's where they begin to take in the image. If I have one bright spot on the floor or in the windows or her forearms, the audience may go straight to that instead of going to her face and I want it to be that. I could just continue to work with a layer mask and undo some of the painting that I did. That's certainly a viable option, but I found over the years that it is easiest to just take that one layer, reduce the opacity a little bit, and you'll get the effect and results you're working for. And as we do the color grade and all the other artistic enhancement to the image, if we find that we don't have enough light on her face, we can simply use an adjustment layer like a levels adjustment, curves adjustment, Adobe Camera Raw as a filter, and bring some of that light back in. We always have a lot of good options. So at this stage, I think we've built everything. It looks good. Now we need to move on to the next step, which is to replace the background with that dark stormy sky. So let's move into that next section. So to get started with the process of replacing the sky, I first want to flatten all of these layers into one. And to do that, I'm going to come up to layer and then down to flatten image. Now, if you'll notice, I have associated a hotkey to flatten image and that's F4. All of the F keys on my keyboard have been bound to basic functions inside of Photoshop. It just saves you a little bit of extra time. So it's something I do recommend that you do. So I'm going to go ahead and flatten the image now and then duplicate it by hitting control or command and the letter J. There's many different ways to make the selection of the windows. We could use the quick selection tool and the select and mask dialog to get a really good accurate selection. And that's what I would typically do, but I want to try something different with this one. It's a practice that is commonly used by many different R's. I just say something I don't do on the regular, but that's to use color range as a selection. So I'm going to come up to select and then down to color range. It's going to open up this dialog. And what I want to do is to use the eyedropper to start selecting an area of color. And it's going to start looking for that color. And then we'll use the other controls to start refining this. So with the eyedropper selected, I'm going to simply click on the white that's in the windows. Now, anything in white is what will be selected. Anything in black is what will not be selected for this. And our goal is to create a selection around the windows that we can replace the sky with, but keep the window frame and the trim inside and intact. So looking at this, this actually looks really good for the windows, but it's not capturing the trees. So now I need to use this tool 
which is the eyedropper with a plus sign, this is going to continue to add to the selection. So I'm gonna come over here and click these yellow greens and start adding that green. And when I clicked that, it added quite a bit into this area of selection. But don't worry, that's okay, because the unique nature of where these windows are, we can make a very quick fix with this. So I'm gonna to continue to select around and make sure that I'm getting as much of those trees. My goal is to see a bunch of white into those window panes wherever we look. So I'm continuing to click and add and make sure I get as much of the colors selected. Now I need to continue to refine it and that's where the fuzziness slider comes in. The more that I increase this, the more that it's gonna continue outward looking for those selections of everything. I think it's about as probably as close as we're going to get. We may have to use our basic brush to do the rest of the work. Oh, there we go. I finally found the one little color somewhere down here that got us some clean windows and that looks pretty good. So if I take the fuzziness slider down to the left, you can see how it's adding more black. So it's reducing what's gonna be selected. And if I take it back to the right, it's adding to that selection. Now using color range to be able to get a really accurate selection, you don't obviously wanna have a lot of white spill off everywhere else, but that isn't an issue here because the windows are by themselves. They're away from the main subject. It's an easy fix. So at this point, I'm gonna say, okay, now we have the marching ants that's showing us the active selection. And all I have to do at this point now is to come back to the layer mask icon and click it. And now we have a layer mask that reflects everything we just saw in color range. So to make sure that we're looking at the right selections, I'm turning off the background layer. In this case, what was inside the selections is all of that bright stuff, all those colors that we selected. I don't want that. I want those things to actually go away. To do that, all I have to do is make sure the layer mask is selected and then hit Control or Command and the letter I for invert. And now that that's gone, if I turn on that background layer, we have that perfect selection now of the windows. They're gone, so we can add a piece of sky stock in between. So I'm going to grab this piece of sky stock that I photographed myself and pull it into the scene. I'm holding the Shift key on the Move tool, and because I'm holding the Shift key, it will drop it right precisely into the new document, right into the center. I just need to move it between these two layers in the layer stack, move it up to where it needs to be, Again, a lot is missing from the selection. We've got a problem there and that's an issue, but this is a very easy fix. So what I want to do is I'm just gonna hit B for brush, make sure my flow is at 100% and I'm gonna start painting white onto the layer mask to reveal the original detail and data everywhere. Painting down through the middle, across the bottom. We could have used the marquee tool to make a selection uh, of the entire area sands the windows and this would have made it a little bit faster but by the time we do all of that we're going to use the marquee tool the polygonal lasso tool the pen tool it's easier just to do a little bit of quick painting i'm going to rotate the screen by holding the letter r and getting it into that horizontal plane because i paint better left to right b for brush start painting white the graphics response right now in Photoshop is a little bit off because at the time of this recording, I uh, unfortunately updated Photoshop CC 2022, which is what I'm using. I have a subscription to the Adobe Creative Cloud and it is something I do recommend because you get the latest updates to Photoshop. But unfortunately, Adobe lately has not been very careful with what they're doing with their updates and this caused some bugs that hopefully will be fixed relatively quickly and one of the bugs right now is that it doesn't seem to play nice with the system resources of the computer between the workload of the gpu the graphics processing unit and the cpu but hopefully again like i said that will be fixed pretty soon so we've painted in all of the areas returning the original data across the scene it looks pretty good let's take i'm going to hit escape to go back to that normal orientation let's take a look at the layer mask itself this is a great way to see any little areas that we might have missed so there's one down here where there's just a little bit of black so we'll paint some white onto the mask to pull back all of that original data this trim work here we can pull back the original data i just want that glass in the windows to be the selected areas and this is a wonderful way to be able to see all of that Continue to paint through here. I'm painting again with that soft round brush at a flow and opacity of 100%. If I go outside the lines here, I am taking my time to be just a little bit careful, but if I go outside those lines, that's okay. I will just either go one step back in my history by hitting Control or Command and the letter Z to go one step back, or 
we can simply switch our color back to black and start painting and undo the mistake that we made. I'm gonna go ahead and rotate the screen one more time. Again, I paint better left to right. Clean up this little bit of trim, a little bit more fine-tuned control using the right and left bracket keys to make my brush bigger and smaller. You can see some black down there on the floor a little bit and clean up this edge just a touch. Okay, let's zoom in. There's some areas right there that we can fix. And then we see these little white specks in the glass. That's some of the trees that were still selected. So I'm going to switch my foreground color to black by hitting the letter X, and then just paint some black into the center here to get rid of all those little bits of the trees that it found. Now, there's going to be some haloing on the trim that we see through here, and that's something that is also an easy fix, and I will demonstrate that for you here in just a moment. Let's continue, whoops. I want to paint some white now and undo that. Let's continue to just clean this layer mask up as much as possible. Moving across the scene, to move across the scene, no matter what tool you're on, if you hold the space bar, it will switch to the hand tool so you can move the image around in your overall document. Let's clean up these areas through here. Get rid of all these little specks. This is one of those minor little things that has a lot of output. So it's worth it to take the time to clean up layer masks. Again, you can see the layer mask and everything that's on it by holding Alter Option and clicking the mask itself. And then when you wanna go back to the normal view, just hold Alt and click it again and it will take you back into that view. And cleaning up these edges just a touch more, getting rid of all that soft little gray and black that I'm seeing because that's some of the selection still reflected into there and I just wanna have all that good detail. And certainly if we miss something, that's okay because we're putting a dark stormy sky behind this wall, so to speak, with gray tones in it. If the wall was like a bright red or pink and then I put a blue stormy sky, dark grays and blues and so forth behind it, then that potentially could stand out and be an issue. But at this stage, I think it looks pretty good where we are. So I'm going to go ahead and hit alter option and click the layer mask to go back into that standard view. Now we have the sky. It's in its effect. I'm going to move it around so that we can see the low horizon line of the clouds close to what I would imagine the horizon line would be just a little bit in this because I don't want the clouds at the top to be down here like this because those clouds at the top were closest to the camera when I photographed the stock. The clouds low to the horizon line are far away and that's one of the ways we can tell distance when we see these clouds and it's vital to be able to work with that. But we have another issue here. The way that this was shot, Chanel's daughter is obviously the focus point of the camera, so she's tacked sharp, but the wall behind her is falling out in that shallow depth of field or that bokeh effect where the details are soft, it's falling out of focus. So I need to do the same for the clouds because the clouds are pretty tacked sharp. So I'm gonna come up to filter, down to blur, and go to Gaussian blur, and a blur, a five or six, not 56, oh my goodness, let's go to five or six pixels. That's enough just to give that soft focus out and everything is clean and it looks pretty good. So I'm gonna zoom back in real quick and see if I can clean up some of this trim just a little bit more. As we can see, there's some areas of the trim that's missing and I want that back. So I'm clicking the layer mask, B for brush, changing my flow to 100% and paint some white to reveal that wooden trim all the way up and down through these areas. If I go outside the line, all I have to do is just be a little bit more precise and come in and paint some black to take that away. Let's go right through there and paint some black. This is a little difficult because I'm painting up and down. And it's also a little difficult because the response time right now is uh, way, way off. And that lag with the system is very difficult to work with. So if anybody from Adobe happens to watch my channel, thank you for watching. Um, please quality control the updates to Photoshop a little bit better than what you all typically do because every single update for several years since the Creative Cloud came into existence, these updates are riddled with bugs and that's just not okay. I went ahead and did a jump cut forward because the input lag right now in Photoshop is just so atrociously broken and it's taking too long. No secrets in that interim of time. All I did was paint white or black onto the layer mask to either take away data that I didn't want to be there or return the data depending upon how precise I was trying to be. And I want to step on a soapbox for just a moment. I believe the reason why Adobe is having problems like this is because they're trying to stay atop of their competitors when it comes to artificial intelligence being put into these programs. 
programs. Other programs that are not as strong as Photoshop, they offer one-click solutions to change the sky or to make good masks around hair on a human subject. And they're marketed and advertised as being a clicked button and then it does it instantly and everything's finished and you as the human being don't have to really do anything. I've been working in Photoshop for over 20 years. I promise you, AI can never do a one-click solution. And the more that these companies keep trying to shove AI into their software to do that, the more that they're breaking the software. Now, AI can get you 75% of the way to the work and getting it completed. AI is a wonderful thing in these programs, and I heavily rely upon it. However, there's always going to be an element of you as the artist, you as the human being, you have to use your human brain and do some simple things inside of Photoshop. And I promise you, painting on a layer mask is not difficult. It can take a couple of minutes. So changing out the sky in this image, really, if I wasn't recording a tutorial for the YouTube channel right now, it would take three or four minutes. Using AI to get 75% of the way there, using my human brain to do the rest. So take the time to continue to do your own work. And don't always rely upon AI technology because I promise you it is never going to be a one click solution to solve those problems. You will have to step in at some point. That's why it's incumbent upon you to continue your own education in Photoshop. But now let's move forward to take care of the haloing that we see around the interior trim on those windows. There's many different ways to do this. I want to explore one that is a relatively simple solution and see if it gets us all the way there to completing that task. And that's to use inner glow as a special effect. So I'm going to come down to the bottom of this window where it says the FX tab, click it, and then I'm going to come up to inner glow. And that's going to bring up the layer style here. Now this purple magenta that I was using before, that's not what I want to use. We'll have to change the color, but this is actually a good thing to demonstrate really quickly. Inner glow is going to look for any interior perimeter on the image and then create a glow from there that cascades inward to the available data. So in this case right now, we have made a mask where we've gotten rid of the windows. And so the sky that was in the original image where we have those dark skies, so we can see the purple everywhere else, but we can also see it on the interior perimeter of the entire image itself. So that is key to pay attention to because we'll need to address that here in just a moment so we can fix that. But let's go ahead and select a color that makes sense. I'm gonna go ahead and click this icon which brings up the color picker and then go to the sky and look for a color to use. Now this is a photo manipulation compositing technique and I'm going to explain how this works but I do want to jump in and say that if you're interested in learning about photo manipulation and compositing in Photoshop I do have an online series that has over 40 hours of education right now centered toward beginners all the way through advanced techniques and tutorials showing you the basics of what you need to know going into the advanced creating full worlds and composites with stock images and characters we have a private subscriber community on facebook where we do live broadcasts and continue to work on each other's work and share our art and so forth if that's something you're interested in doing then take a look at the description below there will be a link to the photoshop composite series on my website that will explain everything you need to know about it and go from there to become a subscriber but when light travels in through windows like this. When light travels anywhere, it takes the color properties with it as it goes. So that dark sky in the background should be bringing in those dark muted grays and so forth cascading into the windows. The reason why we have the haloing right now is because it was a bright sky. So that's luminosity values, but also color. Three fundamentals of digital photo editing, color, luminosity, and detail. So in this case, we have those bright lights and bright colors from the bright sky that was originally there. We have the halos. To change that and fix it, let's just replicate what actually happens in nature when we take these images. So I'm going to look for some of the tones in the sky. And oops, I'm getting just a black color and not any kind of color because I'm accidentally on the layer mask. I didn't select the layer itself. So let's hit cancel and cancel, select the actual layer of the data, then come to the FX tab, inner glow. We're gonna see that hot pink here again. Now let's choose this and choose a tone. Let's start with the light. Now let's, let's go dark. Yeah, I like the dark because it's gonna wrap around that trim and that trim is meant to be dark. So let's choose those darks. That dark may be a little too much. Yeah, I like that one. There we go. We've got a nice little mid-tone of gray into there. We've got a little bit of blue into this. We could artificially change this if we want to and go into the grays, but let's pay attention again to the sky because the whole point here is that that sky should be cascading in and bringing that color and light value with it. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. 
Now, opacity at 100%, that's what we want. And let's look at the size. So I want it to wrap around this trim and give that soft little bit of a glow, but I don't want it to go too far, like something like that, because then it's just replacing the actual wooden trim in the windows and that doesn't look good. So let's go back down. I'm looking at the window trims. Uh, let's go to maybe, I think 10. 10 looks pretty good. I'm gonna go ahead and hit okay. And we can zoom in and inspect it and see the areas that look the best and make sure everything is is good to go but ultimately i think it looks pretty good and adding that inner glow is a great way to solve that haloing issue but it is dependent upon having as clean of a layer mask as you can because any of those little bits from the tree and so forth that they were left over in here we would suddenly see a bunch of inner glow around that because that's a perimeter of data that's why it's important to take the time to clean up that layer mask and why ai will never be able to do that for you it's just simply never going to exist until there are terminators walking around and then we're all screwed so at this point the inner glow looks good and everything's fine, but I want to show you that technique to get rid of it in the interior perimeter of the image itself. Now, because we chose a dark gray color, we aren't seeing it as much as we did with that hot magenta pink, but it's worth exploring this technique to show you how to clean this up. So I'm going to come to where it says the word inner glow and right click it brings up a set of controls and here is create layer. If I click this, it makes a new blank layer that is filled with that color as a soft feathered effect of painting it in and clipped down to this original layer. Because that inner glow is now its own layer, we can put a hide all layer mask onto it. It's hidden everywhere. And then wherever we choose to paint white onto the layer mask at 100% flow and opacity is where it will be revealed. So I'm simply just gonna paint it over the windows and get rid of that little halo and stay away from the interior perimeter of the image itself. And now we have no problems. There's no overall effect. And again, if I wasn't talking and doing a tutorial, all of this entire process would have taken about five minutes total. So I do challenge you and implore you and encourage you to take time to do your own work instead of relying upon one button fixes because they're just going to introduce more problems than good most of the time. So. Let's review very quickly before we go into the final artwork. We've done the retouch. We've done straightening out the image, the raw processing, practical effects to build up shadows, highlights, and midtones to bring all of this in. We've replaced the sky. We've fixed all the errors that we see of haloing and so forth. We can continue to refine those window sills to look for all the little nooks and cranny of bright light and colors to fix that. But ultimately at this stage, I feel like we're okay. Once we add a texture and the color grade to this and all the final artistic enhancements, I doubt anybody's going to look at this beautiful story and go, now, wait a second, I can see some weird lights in that window. He might have changed out the sky. Nobody's going to do that, and it's not that big of a deal. So let's move into the final stage of this tutorial and do the color grade, the artistic enhancements, and complete this story. So the first step, this is a composite. Even though it's a portrait and story and so forth, this is a composite because we change out the sky. So the first step that I always like to do when I create a composite is to make one composite layer of everything that's active in our document right now. So I'm coming to the topmost layer that is active with the eye icon turned on, then I'm gonna hit Control, Alt, Shift, and the letter E for everything or Command, Option, Shift, and E on a Mac. That makes one layer that's a composite of everything that we see. This layer, I wanna make its own document now. So I'm gonna right click anywhere where there's not a word or a thumbnail and then come down to duplicate layer. It'll bring up this duplicate layer dialog. It's gonna duplicate it right now in our existing document, which is this image that we've been working on. I'm gonna change this to be a new document and I could even give it a name if I wish. But I hit okay. Now I have untitled one, which is that composite layer of everything. I'm gonna go ahead and flatten it so we have a layer that's called background. Now, traditionally what I would do is then save this document as a PSD file. I call this my living document that has all of the layers in it so that if I'm working on this one, doing the color grade and the artistic enhancement and I see an error, I can go back to this one and I have all of my preserved layers at the stage where I was when I was ready to go into the final artwork. It's just a helpful way to ensure the integrity of the data that you have in your file if you ever need to go back to it and make changes and you have your new one that you're doing all the artistic enhancements to. But in this case, for purposes of video, I'm not gonna go ahead and save that document because it will take just a few moments. So let's get started with the color grade and the artistic enhancement. I'm going to use the reimagined plugin which is a plugin that I made for Photoshop it's an art plugin that again follows color luminosity and detail 
It is essentially meant as a stepping off point. It's going to create a color grade, some elements to address the luminosity values in the image and enhance the details. You can work with these layers and add new things to them, change them, change their opacities or blending modes and so forth. It was meant as a way to give to all of you my artistic style that I've been using for 10 plus years in Photoshop. So starting with the color grade, I'm going to cycle through all four available colors that are in the plugin right now. But as a spoiler, hint, hint, in 2022, there's a whole new set of colors coming to this plugin. If you buy the plugin now, those new and all the previous owners of the plugin, all those new colors will be sent out to you for free. So I'm going to go ahead and click style number one. And it's going to create two different layers that will give us that color. And let's see the base of it. Ooh, I actually kind of like that. Style number one. You're my favorite right now. So let's go to style number two, which is the purple and orange that's gonna be infused into the scene. No, I, I like style one better. Let's go to style three. And every time we click these, it, ooh, ooh, style three. Oh, style three, you're my friend. And if you mass over them, it will tell you what they do. Soft and warm earth tones create the foundation of color to explore light and detail throughout your image. That sounds very eloquent, doesn't it? Let's go to style number four, which is a teal and orange, which is a typical color grade. I do like the teal. It's giving us some more of that color palette I was talking about earlier, where we would see some of the blues in the backgrounds and then let the oranges of her skin come through. That could certainly work for this, but I'm digging style three. Oh, I like style three. I'm going to go back to style one. Nope, don't like style one anymore. Style three is where it's at. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't even give style one a chance to create its layers. Mm. Style one. Let's see what it is. Nope, I like style three. I think I'm going to settle on style three, but let me know in the comments below which style you would like. And if you own the Reimagine plugin already, thank you for purchasing it. And uh, let me know what favorite colors you use because... I like I, I typically go for style four because for 2022 I'm totally into teal and orange and the Pantone color of the year for 2022 is very peri which is a periwinkle blue and uh, I like that one as well but I'm really into teal and orange because those are the two colors that are commonly used in film color grading. Um, oh, this is a toss up between style four and style three. I'm gonna go with style three. I like this color. I really dig it. Now, I wanna show you a couple of quick things. These two layers, they're broken into, into independent layers, one for color, one for luminosity. So we could reduce the opacity of the color layer if we wish to get some of those original blues back into the scene. I kinda of dig that. So I'm taking that color to like, let's go up to 70%. I, like, I dig that. And if we don't want some of the luminosity changes that happened with this color grade, we can also reduce that as well. As we reduce the opacity, we start getting some of those original pieces of data back through. Uh, into the scene, the contrast, the black point, and so forth. But let's move forward now and go into the next section for luminosity. We're going to add a matte effect to this. I'm going to start with light and see how it works. I like that intensity, but we'll try even. I really actually dig that intensity. Let's go to heavy. Heavy, I think, is just a little too much. We're getting a little too much white point into it. So let's go back to a matte that is even. I dig. Now to balance that matte effect, we can go to contrast, starting with a light intensity. I dig that. Let's go to even. Ooh, I'm liking even too. Uh, I think heavy is going to be way too much, so let's go back to light. Uh, let's stay with light. I like light. We can add some final artistic enhancements, adding some more of that contrast into the scene uh, later. But now let's go into the third and final section, which is details. I'm going to go to general pass and give it a low pass of detail and zoom in just a little bit. We can, of course, enhance this just a little bit more at a later time with those artistic enhancements. Think even. I like even. I like even. So let's keep it at an even intensity. And for the final sharpen, I'm gonna do even as well. For final sharpen, it's going to put that hide all layer mask onto it. It's meant to be painted with white to bring in those areas with pretty heavy intensity of where you wanna see those final sharpened details. And that's over the eyes for me, the bottom of the nose and the nostrils, not the top, but the bottom, and then the lips. Now her hair, I definitely wanna bring out some of that detail and a little bit of that crown. I'm going to stay away from her fingers and arms and so forth. There's plenty of detail with that sharpening that we did just a moment ago with the Reimagine plugin, so I think that looks pretty good. Hit Control or Command on the number zero to zoom all the way back out. 
Yeah, I think that's pretty good for those levels. So we've got a nice little color grade going here. We've got some sharpening, some luminosity values and changes. There's more that we can continue to do with this. So let's explore that now. What I want to do is go ahead and flatten the entire thing. This is working destructively. Working destructively simply means that I have compressed all of those changes down into one layer. And as I continue to go forward in my history states, if I go too far, I will not be able to go back to this point. Working non-destructively would mean I would just preserve all of the layers we've been doing this entire time. Most of the time for my personal work and so forth, I work destructively. If I'm doing commercial work, I work non-destructively because I always need to be able to go back at some point when the art director says, can we just see it maybe with these 17 other options? So at this point, we're working destructively, everything looks good. I'm gonna do a couple of things quickly. Even though we did a color grade with style three, let's go ahead and do a couple of other techniques really fast to add some of that teal and orange and see if compounded with the browns and earth tones we see if we can get a really cool result. So one of my favorite ways to color grade, it's very simple, using the adjustment layers in Photoshop with this icon. I'm gonna make a solid color adjustment layer. Let's go for that teal. And let's go for a neutral teal that's at a brightness of 45%. And that will become abundantly clear and why I want 45% in just a moment. I'm gonna change the blending mode to soft light. Now soft light in Photoshop is gonna take any color that's 49% or 0% in brightness and make the image darker. Any color that is 51% or higher to 100% in brightness, it's gonna make the image brighter. That's why I chose that darkness color. That looks pretty good. Let's also explore lighten really quickly. Lighten is meant to lighten up the shadows with a color. Let's reduce the overall opacity to like 30%. Okay, lighten or soft light? Ooh, soft light, I think soft light, but let's reduce the opacity just a little bit more because again, subtlety is key inside of Photoshop. Now let's go ahead and add another solid color adjustment layer. This one, I want to go into those orange tones. This one, I'm going to do soft light for sure. So I'm gonna make this let's say 60% in brightness right now. And let's choose a more saturated tone. Okay. Hit okay. Now change the blending mode to soft light so we can see it. And then let's take the opacity of this down and let's go into that 30% maybe. 32%, subtlety is key inside of Photoshop. Let's put it at the top of the layer stack. Now I'm going to invert this mask by hitting Control or Command the letter I for invert, paint with white at a flow of 10%. I'm just gonna start bringing this back just a little bit on her daughter, on her body. 10% is too much, I can't control it. So let's go down to 3%, painting with white, there we go. A softer flow. And I'm gonna go to 1%. Undo some of this just a little bit, feathering it back by painting black onto the mask. Now painting with white again and just kind of feathering it in a little bit around her. And this is a good way of painting where we don't have to be super technically precise. Getting it off the dress just a touch in those areas where the light's coming in, but keeping it on the center of her body and her arms just a little bit. So let's do a quick before and after, before and after. We're warming her back up with those tones. We can always change the colors if we need to, make them brighter, darker. Let's go darker. 45% darkness, there we go. And then take the opacity down just a little bit more. We're at negative, or at 24%. Getting just that little hint of warmth on her, which is gonna help the audience's focus go into her. So I like those two elements. Now I wanna do the final artistic enhancements to the image, so I'm gonna flatten it, duplicate the layer, and hit Control, Shift, and A, or Command, Shift, and A to go into Adobe Camera as a filter. And last little steps I wanna do in here, I'm gonna increase the black point just a little bit across the scene. Enhance the contrast just a bit, which is also enhancing the color. Okay, I'm going to give it a significant boost to texture because it's going to increase the texture overall. And I want some of that grittiness into the detail because, again, this is a gritty, dark, sad story. We'll increase the vibrance just a touch. I like that. Increase that black point just a little bit more and maybe just a little bit of a boost to the white point. Okay, we'll hit OK. Now let's bring in a texture, which is a thing that I love to do that adds an interesting level to everything. This is a piece of stock that I purchased from Adobe. The image number uh, is at the bottom of the screen in case you'd like to buy this from Adobe as well. This is an 8-bit image right now because it's a JPEG. So I'm going to come up to image mode and down to 16 bits to convert it to 16 bits. Hit V for the move tool, hold shift, bring it into untitled one, which is our new document. I'm going to rotate it because I'm on the move tool. And this icon is checked that says show transform controls. I'm seeing the transform controls automatically so I can rotate it wherever I want it to be. 
and hit escape again and then hold the shift key and rotate it and it does it in those even degree increments. So that looks good. Hit enter to accept the transformation. Now we need to change the blending mode so we can see the original image. Soft light is one that typically works well when you're adding a texture to the entire scene. And that grittiness of this is now being enhanced even more. But what's also happening is that there is a natural vignette built into this. We have a bright white center and a darker outer perimeter with cascading midtones of gray in between. That's why I like this texture because it adds a natural vignette to the scene. I'm digging it. I'm gonna go ahead and flip this vertically by coming up to edit, transform, and flip vertical. Okay, that looks pretty good. Interesting, texture's working well. I think I wanna take it off Chanel's daughter. I wanna take the texture off of her. I want it to be softened. I want the texture everywhere else, but except on her and the skin. I just wanna soften it down just a touch. Now, typically you would think, well, if I wanna take it away, I would use a layer mask and paint some black and go away with it. But if I do that, it's also taking away the effect of color and what's happening with that vignette. So the best way to do this is I'm going to come to the lasso tool and go to the traditional lasso tool. And I'm gonna make just a rough kind of selection right around Chanel's daughter. Doesn't have to be super precise. And then I'm going to hit Shift and F6, which brings up the Feather Selection option. I'm gonna feather this selection so it isn't a hard perimeter edge that we just made with that lasso tool. Let's go to 50 pixels as a soft general feather. Now that feathered soft effect or selection has been made, let's come up to Filter, down to Blur, and Gaussian Blur. And now let's give this a very significant Gaussian Blur. And what that's doing is blurring out all of the texture but still leaving that color data there so we see the vignette effect. Now I'm going to hit Control or Command letter D for deselect to get rid of that. And it gave us that soft focus of this. If I hold Alt or Option and click the eye icon that will turn off the other two, see how it's soft now and that texture is gone. So that's part of that process that preserves the color data and what it's doing with this texture but gets rid of all the details into it. If we want just a little bit more light on our face, which spoilers I do, I'm going to add a levels adjustment layer and just increase the midtones just a little bit. Then invert the mask, control or command letter I for invert, paint white onto the mask. We're at a flow of 1%, let's go to a flow of 10% and just paint a little bit of white right there on her face to bring back some of that detail. Now I wanna add one more vignette because I just love vignettes. It pushes the audience's focus right into the center of the scene. And my favorite way to add a vignette is to do a solid color adjustment layer. Choose pure black where the RGB values are set to zero. Hit okay. Change the blending mode to soft light. And then on the layer mask itself, that is a reveal all or a white one, I'm gonna hit G for the gradient tool. And then come up to the radial gradient. I'm gonna change the flow of my gradient to 30%. And then I also want to make sure that I'm actually using the gradient that makes the most sense, which is foreground color to transparency. Right now my foreground color is set to white. I need to switch that to black and I'll do that in a moment, but I wanna explain why this is important. I'm gonna be painting black onto this white layer mask to start taking away the effect. I want the dark outer perimeter. I don't want it right in the center. So I wanna be able to do that with that radial gradient, which is gonna make a circle. And as I stretch the gradient tool out, it's gonna make a bigger circle or smaller depending on how far I stretch it. But I need it to be the foreground color to transparency where it fades into nothingness. If it was white to black, it's going to just give you hard edges and only do it one time wherever you do it because it's trying to paint a complete effect of circle from one color to another. If we do it from one color to transparency, then it will build it up everywhere where we choose it to be. So I'm selecting that one. Again, making sure that I'm on the radial gradient. Now to switch my foreground color, I'm just gonna hit the letter X and now we're on black. Now if I stretch this line, the bigger I stretch it, the bigger of a gradient it's going to paint. So I wanna start first, small, over the subject. And just build up a little bit of that gradient. Now let's start over the window sources and let that come in and see some of that light. Now I'm gonna zoom out even further in the document by hitting Control or Command and the minus key because I wanna make some big gradient marks. The bigger the gradient, the bigger the circle. We're feathering it in, but because we're on a flow of opacity of 30%, we're not doing it super strongly in all those areas. Let's cascade it back just a few steps in the history. I got a little too overzealous. Zooming in a little bit, so the before and after. It's a subtle little change 
But again, vignettes are meant to be subtle. We don't want it to be in your face, hard, round, ovular, black outer perimeter pushing us in. That's a classic vignette, but it's not one that I care for. It's just this solid little effect that makes the environment just a little bit darker. We can always feather the effect by turning it back on, reducing the opacity down to, let's say, 65%. So we just have that soft, little subtle push because subtlety is key inside of Photoshop. At this point, I think the artwork is done. So let's finish up this tutorial with some final thoughts. My final thoughts are one that goes back to the idea of what photography is always about. In the days of film, the idea was that we needed to get the image perfect in camera because there was very little that could be done to change it. So if we photographed an image on a bright day and we wanted it to be a dark, stormy sky and moody story, we just had to wait until there was a dark, stormy sky and go do this. In digital photography and digital photo editing, the sky is the limit for what we can do with these things. But I believe that it is often a practice where folks get stuck in their minds that the more that they change the image, they're doing something wrong. It may not be completely consciously in your mind, but I, I've spoken to so many of my students that tell me that sometimes they feel like, well, the more and more they're doing in Photoshop, the more they're altering the original artwork of the image. I feel like that's okay, because that's the beauty of digital photo editing. We can realize our visions and our imagination and take the base foundation of all of that data and work with it like things like practical passes in Adobe Camera Raw to be able to build up more effects and get an image, an artwork that speaks to what we saw as artists and what we're trying to show the world. That's the end of this tutorial. If you like the tutorial and the content in it, please give the video a like and consider subscribing to the channel because new content debuts each week in photography and Photoshop education. And when you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell icon to be notified of that new content when you return to the YouTubes. Thanks for watching today. And until next time, I'll see you out there in the world of Photoshop.